technology. Many skeptics appeal to the following quote by Douglas Adams as a refutation of the fine-tuning argument, where Adams says, this is rather as if you imagine a puddle waking up one morning and thinking, this is an interesting world I find myself in, an interesting hole I find myself in. Fits me rather neatly, doesn't it? In fact, it fits me staggering well. Must have been made to have me in it. Now, Adams is a pretty good author, and perhaps there is a meaningful lesson in his analogy, but I have to say it's very disanalogous to the fine-tuning. For in Adams' analogy, gradually the puddle gets smaller and smaller, but still the water conforms well to the hole. There's nothing special required about the shape of the hole for it to efficiently hold water. So if we discovered that any set of constants or initial conditions would permit life, then the puddle analogy would be ap applicable. For indeed, you would not have fine-tuning at all. But since the universe is finely tuned to support life, it's quite disanalogous. It's totally opposite, actually. Any configuration of dirt in a hole supports water, whereas very, very few configurations of physics can support life. David Deutsch is an atheist physicist and happens to be a Royal Society Fellow who studied the fine-tuning in detail. And he explicitly states in response to this analogy that it doesn't hold water. In fact, Deutsch challenges people to accept the reality of the physics of fine-tuning, saying if anyone claims not to be surprised by the special features that the universe has, he's hiding his head in the sand. These special features are surprising and unlikely. Similarly, opponents to fine-tuning sometimes claim that we're adapted to the universe. The universe is not adapted to us. Or they'll say something like, well, evolution will find a way. But this very much misunderstands the fine-tuning claim, which deals with what is necessary for life to even start. If life doesn't start, then needless to say, it cannot evolve. So no matter how powerful evolution is, self-replicating life must exist before it can evolve. And in my own study of the peer-reviewed scientific literature, I think generally physicists are being fairly conservative in their assessment of what constitutes a life-permitting universe. They're generally looking for severe catastrophes where we can fairly safely say that no life would be possible in such a universe. So if someone wants to dispute that, I think they need to interact with the actual 200 plus papers out there where physicists are claiming that the universe is finely tuned to support life. So here's a couple of quotes that might enlighten those that would think the physicists are being sloppy or not accounting for evolution or something of that nature. So the first one is by Alan Lightman of MIT, and he says, if these fundamental parameters were much different from what they are, it is not only human beings which would not exist, but no life of any kind would exist. Or Craig Hogan saying, changing the quark masses by even a small amount has drastic consequences for which no amount of Darwinian selection can compensate. So they very much assume evolution could do a lot, but they're looking at whether it could even get started. And I think this really comes to bear, you can really see clearly how these objections fail when you just look at a very specific example. So let's look at the cosmological constant and see how well could evolution help overcome the problems uh, that you would have if you don't have a finely tuned universe with respect just to say one of the constants, the cosmological constant, which admittedly is perhaps the most finely tuned. So here I would like to reference again the, the excellent book, A Fortunate Universe by Geraint Lewis and Luke Barnes. And quoting from them, they say, make the cosmological constant just a few orders of magnitude larger and the universe will be a thin uniform hydrogen and helium soup, a diffuse gas where the occasional particle collision is all that ever happens. Particles spend their lives alone, drifting through emptying space, not seeing another particle for trillions of years, and even then just glancing off and returning to the void. Now you might think that that doesn't sound very finely tuned if the constant can vary by a few orders of magnitude before this disaster happens. But because we have known contributions to the cosmological constant, 120 orders of magnitude greater than the value in our universe, actually changing it by a few orders of magnitude would still be fine tuning to one part in 10 to the power of 117 or so. 
So this is a very, very extreme case of fine tuning and even looking at the most optimistic estimates of how that could possibly re be reduced based on supersymmetry or something of the nature, you still end up with at least 50 orders of magnitude of fine tuning before you get to this incredible uh, catastrophe for life where you don't even, you don't have anything ingredient wise except hydrogen and helium and therefore no real chemistry. But the bigger thing is that these particles are so sparsely distributed throughout the universe that they hardly ever even get in causal contact with each other.